I just want to finish, and I know we're kind of going a little bit slowly, but let's just make sure uh, we're going to, you know, go a little bit faster as we go through. Um, but the foundations, you know, uh, are important. So, so um, there is a few other things that I wanted to mention here. The first one is that uh, I'm sure sooner or later you all are going to find yourself in a situation where you've got some data or you want data from somebody and they are not willing to give it to you or you're not allowed to share the data with the third party. Okay, lots of complications. Uh, this uh, gives you a clue as to how you can generate synthetic data to meet your uh, the specifications of your real data. So scenario number one is you have the data, but your institutional review board, IRB, does not allow you to share the data with, some, with a colleague who really wants to help you with something, okay? So in these situations, what you can do is you can generate synthetic data or semi-synthetic data that has some of the characteristics of the real data, and that you can share. So the question is, how do you do that? Uh, scenario number two is where you want somebody else's data, but they are not allowed to give it to you, and you can uh, work with them to uh, mock around a data set that you can begin to train, uh, I don't know, your algorithm or fine tune our algorithm while they are um, ensuring proper access for you for the data. Is everybody here with me? Um, to put it bluntly, uh, people are not sharing data for various reasons, and when there is no communication in terms of sharing or methods, people don't. I had a great colleague of mine, you know, great guy, uh, 1,500 publications, huge. He says, this is my tool chest, I don't share with anybody. You know. So there are, there are some of these people. But you're, uh, you know, uh, we should try to share because it optimizes the return on investment, which is a very important measure of efficiency, you guys. The society cannot afford anymore to have these silo developments where I analyze my data, you analyze your data, she analyzes her data, it, it doesn't work that way anymore. It, it's just not cost effective. So, uh, the point of this data simulation primer is to show you examples of how different types of things can be generated synthetically. So, uh, this uses um, the health evaluation and linkage of primary care data set. You can download it, look at it, and, um, you know, here the data is being read again. Um, oh, attach data. If you have a data set that you pulled out from somewhere, cloud or local services, if you want to have direct access to every variable in the data set, you have to attach it, which simply tells R to bring on a higher level the variable definitions in this data set because they are always going to be secondary. There may be naming collisions. Your data set has a variable called age, and there is another 150 data sets that have an, a variable called age. So if you just do summary of age, how do I know which variable are you referring to? Okay, When you attach something, you put it on the top of the stack, and it R always looks there for the variables before it goes down the stack. Is everybody here with me? It just Name, naming convention, your data set comes on the front. This happens very often, believe it or not. You may be thinking that you're referencing uh, the gender distribution of one data set. It turns out it was down the stack in our computer, the gender distribution of another set which was more visible. 
So attach and detach brings the data set to a focus for now. Uh, okay. So uh, always with these types of data sets, here's a summary. You can look at the characteristics of each of the data elements or features in your data set. For example, what's the mean response? How much deviation was there? Was the data of certain type, discrete, continuous, categorical, factor, you know, whatever? Because you need that to synthesize uh, synthetic data of the same type so that the algorithm or whatever process needs to consume or ingest that data needs to be properly configured or tailored or tuned. Um, all right, so coming down, so you plot some of these things, and then you're going to begin to use R functions that generate pseudo-random numbers, pseudo-random values. Later, I can show you how you can generate real, real, real simulated data that are not pseudo-random, but they're real random. There is a service in the United States that provides uh, real uh, random observations based upon uh, atmospheric random noise, okay? Uh, which is incredible. Your data could be integers. You can put them into different ranges. You know, you can do magical things with real data because all these things that I'm showing you are norm, means random normal variable. They're actually generated by a deterministic algorithm. I can generate two sequences of 100 observations. Let me show you. They are completely identical. So for example, if I just do, look, uh, if I do a set seed, and let's set my seed as one, two, three, four, and then I do my, and then I do my random sample of X1. And I do another one that I'm gonna call X2. Oh, before that, I need to do the same C. By the way, if you have two command lines that you wanna put on the same line, you have to separate them by a semicolon. Okay. So does everybody see what I'm doing here? I set the C, and then I'm generating a thousand random normal observations, setting the same C, and generating another X2. Now, these X1 and X2 are gonna be identical. See, if I do X1 equals to X2, it tells me that they're all true, they're all identical. So how can they be identical? I'm, I'm asking them to generate random numbers because I set the seed, and when you set the seed, you control this reproducibility of results. If I do it one more time without setting the seed, look what happens now. I'm just going to take away the seed now here in this command line. And let's call this one X3 so that I don't mess around with them. And now let's compare X3 to X2. They're all different. Is that right here with me? So all these functions, R norm, R binomial, R Poisson, R Cauchy, all the different distributions that you can sample from, they're pseudo-random numbers, is what I'm saying. Uh, the reason why they look random is that when the seed is not set, the computer kind of goes through an algorithm and it has a, a repeating pattern every two to the 25th power or something like that. It, it very rarely repeats. It's very unlikely to get the same numbers. Is that right here with me? Unless you force it by putting the right C. Okay, so back to here. So you're gonna look at, look, this is just one of the variables, okay? And you look at its histogram, you kind of look at uh, the mean, and here is the data one, H, for example, has a mean of 34 and a standard deviation of uh, almost 12 years, okay? So what we can do is we can, um, generate synthetic data that has the same things using uniform, normal, Poisson, any of this R has hundreds of distributions. In the probability distributed project, let me just show you real quick. 
so we are on the same page here. This tributon.org. You know, uh, everybody understands when we say genome, we mean the collection of all genes, for, typically for an organism. When you say distributon, you mean the collection of all probability distributions. Typically univariate, but they could be bivariate, trivariate, multivariate, and whatnot. So this probability distributed project has these web apps. And if you go to the calculators, for example, you see all these many, many, many different distributions. Uh, here is Poisson, for example. And you know, has one parameter. You can plot the probability density function or the cumulative distribution function. The probability density function tells you for a Poisson process what's the likelihood of you observing between, for instance, uh, or let's say less than 100 as the number of arrivals within a certain period of time. The probability is 92.2%. So notice the shape of this distribution. And if I select another one, it's going to be, so here is the normal, it's going to be totally different. Uh, here is Cauchy, for example. Cauchy distribution. Now, <coughs> this distribution does look symmetric, unimodal, but it's not bell-shaped. It's not bell-shaped because it has what's called fat or heavy tails. So in other words, the probability that you observe extremely large or extremely small values are not rapidly decreasing to zero. They are going to zero, but not fast enough. They're approaching zero at the rate of x squared. One over x squared, that is. So quadratic decay, as opposed to the normal distribution, the tails go down to zero exponentially fast, right? So things that look alike are not necessarily these. Are bad. Remember, I showed you actually how S-shaped the QQ normal plot between Cauchy and, and normal distributions work. So uh, with all these distributions that you have, you can essentially uh, use them to uh, synthetically generate cases. So here is, for example, one situation where I want to have 282 subjects, four time points. I want to generate some synthetic data. And the cases, I'm going to call them, you know, these are the case IDs, these are the subject identifiers. So you can repeat, remember we have repeat, you have sequence, you have all kinds of things, but suppose you want to skip some. So there is no four and five indices here. So there is 282 of these things. And then you see, when you start talking about specific features like the left coded surface area, for example, you want to um, generate random Poisson as many subjects, and the parameter of the Poisson is 600. Then for some of the other ones, you also use Poisson distribution. And I, um, I can show you what Poisson looks like. And then you're going to switch a little bit, perhaps. Here you're going to use uniform, random, uh, uniform distribution, which is kind of flat. The likelihood that you're within an uh, interval of certain width is exactly the same no matter where you are. Uniform distribution, except that sex is binary. So when I use uniform distribution, I need to dichotomize this. And to dichotomize something is I can say, if else, the randomly generated uniform number is less than 0.5, call it the male, otherwise call it a female. You can have these 0 and 1 be the letters M and L, whatever you want to call them, F, M, whatever you want to uh, associate. Then when it comes to determining the weights of the individuals, Maybe there is a BMI, body mass index, heights, uh, metabolic states, blood pressure, vital signs, whatever uh, uh, is accounted for. So you can use normal distribution. Uh, and suppose the weight is whatever, in kilograms 80, give or take 10 as average. And then, and then you convert these because weights do need to be, well, not always, but many a times they need to be integer. So here is a method S dot integer casts casts a floating point number that the, the random normal distribution is, casts it as an integer. Yeah. Is there any reason why for the weight, 
Yes, weights and heights are well known across the different taxa to be normally distributed. Now, give or take, okay? Uh, but but it's not a, it's not that. And if you wanna if you want to load it, if you wanna have. Uh, Does your computer have Java, Eric? Do you have Java on, on the laptop or no? Uh, not on the No? OK. For those of you that are on PCs, if you have Java, I have a beautiful um, uh, soccer applet which allows you to generate mixtures of distributions. It's really pretty. Yeah. I can't show you here, but maybe after class, I can pull my machine and show you. Uh, uh, okay, so let me see here. Let me see if I can show you guys a histogram of what we had X1, X, uh, okay, X, maybe I want to do a, this was zero minutes, so maybe uh, five times X1 uh, plus X or minus. Suppose I do minus x2 and then plus one uh, or twice x3. Uh, okay, that doesn't look. How about density? Not perfect, but you guys can see that this is definitely not a symmetric graph, right? Does everybody see how? Uh, maybe I can make it bigger. So this looks uh, a bit, and, and you you could have, for example, uh, let me just see if I put in. Okay, maybe I need to load it a little bit more. Okay, so hold on, let's try this. What I'm trying to do is I'm, I'm trying to show you how I can make something very realistic without going outside of the parametric distribution world. So mixing is what I'm doing here. I'm mixing three different, three different uh, features together to essentially construct something that's a bit more... Okay, now that's, that's a very common thing to get actually for weights. Now, this may appear that two distributions were mixed together and you can see the, the median for one and the median for the other one. When they're mixed together, it looks like one, one distribution, right? So that's what I'm saying. With mixtures, you can model it really well. And again, for those of you that are interested in exactly how these things happen in practice, I've got a couple really cool Java applets that I can show you afterwards. Yeah. Right, so we have a tool for this, but it's called Soccer Modeler. You literally get the column, uh, you, you get the column vector that you have, you plug it in the Java applet, and then select a family of distributions, and it fits a distribution, shows you how the histogram and the distribution align, and it reports for you the resulting model. So we know how to do that. Now I'm kind of doing, Mickey Mouse games by playing around with this and trying to get something that's not normal. But typically you go the other way around. You look at the histogram of the data and then you try to find well, what combination of these is going to give me something similar. Okay, so let's keep it, let's keep it a, 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 a level lower just to see <coughs> some of the intricacies when simulating. You can go more complex, you can, you can do a really nice job with this. So. Um, Back to here. Okay. Um, now notice how you know I'm I'm making quite a bit of use of the if else condition. So this allows me to binarize 
or dichotomize a continuous variable into two states. Or if it's three states, three states, I can use three different levels. If it's any categorical or non-ordinal variable, I, we can convert to these as well. So we see here is the genetics, for example. Genotypes are typically known to be uh, uh, of one of one of several things. So, for example, here you see we're having a column vector, and then the first condition is whether or not a random uniform uh, uh, number between one and one hundred is less than seventy percent. And if so, I assign to it zero. If not, I assign to it one. And then, uh, if I, and then I have another condition and a third condition, and these put in together give me the genotype for this chromosome 17 reference sequence, and that's the unique reference sequence of the specific SNP that I'm trying to mock up here, okay? And there could be several of these, so here is one, here is where we do the genetics, here is where you do the diagnosis, for example, in this case we have three populations, Parkinson's disease, healthy controls, and subjects without evidence of dopaminergic deficit. So these are the Parkinsonian subjects that the imaging scan cannot conclusively determine that they're, they're patients. The imaging scan is inconclusive, although they do exhibit some of the clinical symptoms. So these are people in between. So that's how, so you can repeat, uh, construct a vector with 100 Parkinson's, 100 controls, and the remaining, remember, we have 282 subjects in total that we want to uh, construct. And after the genetics come the clinical data. Well, for the clinical data we're going to use, so here is this mixture. We're mixing together two uniforms, two uniform distributions with different criteria. And then we do some uh, other things. And at the end, what we need to do is we need to sample the time point. Ah, the time point will be added automatically at the end. So at the end, once you put the genetics, the imaging, the clinical data, you kind of column bind it together. C bind stands for get all these columns and package them together into a single computable R data object, which is going to be called a sim for simulated PD data. And you simply, you know, uh, repeat these cases for, across all times. So this ending object is going to have the data that you should share with your colleagues. Now, remember, it kind of resembles the real data. But if you didn't do right all the model fits, you may either be sending um, uh, data that's not completely accurate, or, or it could be misleading. You know, it, it depends upon what, what, what the goal of the exercise is. But this is one way that you can uh, use to simulate data. And then printing the summary of the simulated data and comparing this against the summary of the real data is going to tell you if you're really way off on some of the variables. Is everybody here with me? Now, you should be within limits, right? I mean, they can be identical, but they should be uh, comparable. 